Let's turn to Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Thank you, Jesus. It said, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Amen. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he, talking about God, counted it to him for righteousness. This morning, I just the Lord put a, a simple message on my heart, simple title, titled Hope. Let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to speak your truth, Lord. I know that you placed a word in my heart, Lord. Even while I was speaking Wednesday night, Lord, you preached a word in my heart about hope, Lord. You tugged in my heart about hope, Lord. Whenever you want to speak of hope, that means that some feel hopeless, Lord God. And I just pray that this morning that you would flow, Lord, like a river. And that you're a river of anointing, Lord God, would reach deep down inside the hearts of your people. Lord, that you would allow your word to go forth, Lord, and to do what it was sent forth to do. That it wouldn't return unto you void, but that instead it would accomplish your perfect will, Lord. Your perfect will is that your people would be given hope, Lord. That they would be received the hope, the supernatural hope of the Holy Spirit that's available to us because of what Jesus has done. And we pray, Lord God, that you would do what you do this morning and that you would have your way in our lives and in our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was sharing this passage of scripture Wednesday night and uh, where Abraham was questioning God about his promises and I felt the Lord tugging on my heart about the concept of hope. And, you know, in the natural Abraham situation was impossible. God had promised something. But the promise lingered and now so distant, uh, it seemed impossible and hopelessness was beginning to set in. And after all, he was 100 and Sarah was 90 and they were past the age of childbearing. It wasn't going to happen anymore is what it seemed like. We know that the supernatural birth of Isaac, this is where I tend to live, is in types and shadows and, and being able to re unfold from the Old Testament, New Testament truths because it just encourages my faith and my belief in the Bible. And we know that the supernatural birth of Isaac is a type of the, of the birth that would come in Jesus. Amen. But also, in addition to that, I don't want to get past the barren womb of Sarah. Because I believe in the barren womb of Sarah, we see another type. We see a type of the life of the Christian where no fruit is being produced. We see a type, maybe even more specifically in the life of a Christian, that has been believing God for something to happen. Yet the promise seems to linger. It's not showing up the way that we would have expected it to. We knew that God had promised something on the inside of our life, but we're not seeing anything happening. We're expecting God to move, but now expectancy is starting to give way to despair. Yes, yes. Whether it's a lack of spiritual fruit in our personal lives or a lack when we aren't personally experiencing the things in our lives we would expect God to do for us, in those situations, it's easy for us to become discouraged. Yes. It's very easy to begin to feel barren and alone in those circumstances. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. The scripture says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Some clarification of these words. The word deferred literally means to drag along and a sickened heart describes one that is overwhelmed with grief and it's full of sorrow. 
But I like the meaning whenever you read about a tree of life, that whole phrase, that concept. It describes a barren tree. You know, like winter has an effect on a tree that's alive and it causes it to shrivel up and look like it's dead. The leaves turn brown. The branches almost look like they're becoming brittle. But then when the springtime shows up, and that's really the meaning whenever you look at it in the Hebrew, springtime shows up and a revival happens. I don't know about you, but what the church needs is a revival, amen. And not just the church, but each and every one of our hearts needs a revival where the Holy Spirit would come in and cause life to take place. When springtime shows up and that breath of fresh air hits it, then that tree begins to look the way that it was created to look. Leaves start to rustle in the wind. The leaves start to shimmer the light of the sun. And in a similar fashion, the life of the Christian is supposed to look that way. It's supposed to radiate the joy of the Lord. Amen. But many times we find ourselves instead in a situation where the promise is deferred and it's dragging along. And we're beginning to feel sickened that it's never going to arrive. But when that promise arrives, hallelujah. You know, unfortunately for Christians... Unfortunately, Christians are not exempt from depression, hopelessness, despair. The enemy will work harder to plague the Christian with depression than he will someone in the world. If Satan can keep us focused on our problems and our situations, then he can keep our eyes off the Lord. He can draw, draw us into a swamp of hopelessness. Even though the joy of the Lord and the hope of God is waiting to give us strength right there the whole time. How many times in my own personal life, and I know that you've experienced this some too, so I want to remind you of this. How many times in my own personal life and in your lives, you felt like you were in this swamp of despair, the miry clay. You couldn't move forward. You couldn't get out. But yet, not just forgetting because you were so focused on your situation, but then with just one whisper in the, me, in the midst of your feeling of hopelessness, with one whisper to say, I don't have anywhere else to turn, but I know where to turn, so I'm going to turn to the Lord. And with a whisper uh, of the name of Jesus, hallelujah, fresh breath air, fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit would reach in and it would begin to bring life into your situation. The circumstance may not have changed. You might still go be going through it today. But if you're going through with the presence of God in the middle of your life, you're going to make it through. Hallelujah. He's there to make you, make you through. But you know, once again, the enemy, he will still try to plague you with depression. Don't ever forget that, child of God. It's never going to change. I don't care how much you love Jesus, how much you love his word. The enemy is not going to quit. Don't you wish he'd quit? I was thinking about that. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, I was thinking, man, it'd be so awesome if the devil just got grossed out by us. (laughs) You know? Like, ooh. Like the world. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm talking about the world and, and even people in the church. I remember when the Lord first got a hold of me, man, I became so excited about Jesus. And I was talking about the Lord. Every conversation was flipped into Jesus. One guy's talking about this quarterback and how he can scramble and hit people keeping his eyes down the field. And somehow Jesus keeps his eye on you, man. And and it's like I can remember how they would get so frustrated. It's like, dude, all you want to do is talk about Jesus. Don't you wish the devil was like that? And he'd get tired and he'd be so frustrated because we love Jesus now so much that he didn't even want to be around us. Wouldn't that be a beautiful world to live in? Unfortunately, that's not the way that it is. (laughs) He's never going to quit. He operates. His hope is to frustrate us and bind us so that we will be distracted from doing the will of God. And ultimately, his plan is that we will pull away from God. I'm telling you right now, his plan for your life, the enemy's plan is to make you pull away from God. He wants to he wants to bury you in so much despair and depression that you begin to feel hopeless in your situation and you don't know how in the world you're going to get out and ultimately he wants to make you think this Christianity stuff doesn't work. He'll blame everybody around you. He will blame your mama, your daddy. He'll blame your children. He'll cause you to blame the preacher and Lord knows the preacher needs some help. He'll cause you to blame your best friend. He'll cause you to put your eyes in your focus Focus on anything in any situation to hopefully make you give up on God and quit. He doesn't want you to hold on to the Lord. But the Bible says Abraham staggered 
not. Look at me in Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. It says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. You know, when we're strong in the faith, we give glory to God, even in the midst of our situations. Amen? Sometimes we're plagued by these things, but we hold on to the Lord, and people will even know that you're going through a stressful time, a trial in your life, and the grace of God filling you up and strengthening you will bring glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. That word staggered means to withdraw or separate. Like I was saying, the enemy wants to cause us to separate ourselves from the Lord, to withdraw from the faith. Abraham staggered not at the faith. I'm not going to write it on the board because I believe I can give you a mental picture. It's a real simple concept. The faith. I know I've talked about it before. There's a difference between faith, let's add I-N-G to it, faithing, making it an action word. Daily, I'm believing God, trusting God. I have faith, a verb, versus the faith. It's a noun. It's a place. It's a place that God has brought us into whenever we chose to use our verb faith to place it in the promise of God, which is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when we took our verb faith and placed it in Jesus, that miracle happened where the Lord translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. He placed us in a new atmosphere. Hallelujah. And I have said it a million times, but I won't ever apologize again for saying it a million and one, that in this new place called Christ, there's access to grace. And where the grace of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. Because His presence will set us free. Amen. Abraham staggered not. He didn't give up and it's an important that we understand that Abraham wasn't perfect in every sense of the word. Abraham didn't always do it right, church. I kind of halfway mentioned this Wednesday night, but I'm going to say a little bit more. It's important we understand that he made some good decisions, but he also made some bad decisions. One good decision, and we're not going to go there, but in Genesis 13, 5 through 11, if you're taking notes, I'll just remind you of the story. I've preached on it many times. Abraham and Lot. Lot connected himself to Abraham. That was a smart decision. Amen. When we see brothers and sisters in the faith that are moving forward with the plan of God, it's a good thing that we fellowship with them and commune with them. Abraham was being blessed by God. Lot also was richly blessed by God, so much so that the land could no longer contain their prosperity. Both at the same time. So the Lord, so they realized they were going to have to separate. And so the way that I've preached this in the past is this, is that Abraham made a decision based on an eternal promise. Many times in our life, we make decisions based on an eternal promise. We know, in other words, we know God has a will for our life. We know that ultimately God's will is that we would serve him. And so every decision that we make should be predicated upon that. In other words, we should not step outside of that. When we start making decisions for our lives that are outside of the known will of God, we begin to, de we begin to take a veer or another pathway that brings us further away from the will of God. Abraham had an eternal promise by God. God told him, come out from your father's house. I will make you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and through your seed in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God according to the plan. So what he did was he told Lot, he said, hey, you choose the way you want to go, and, and then I'll just go in the opposite direction. And what did Lot do? Lot made a sensual choice. When I'm saying sensual, I'm talking about his eyes beheld the green pastures of the Jordan Valley. They're herders. It makes sense. They need green grass, right? Sometimes our decisions are logical, but they're not necessarily spiritual. Sometimes God will operate in the logical, but sometimes he operates outside of that. Sometimes God will tell us to do something and it doesn't necessarily make sense. But whatever God's going to tell us to do, it will line up according to his word. Yes. Amen. The Bible says Lot saw the water, the, 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 that the Jordan Valley was well watered. And what he did was, he, what did he do? He pitched, it, pitched his tent towards Sodom. Before it's over with, he's in the middle of the world. 
literally destroyed his family. We won't even get into all that. What ended up happening to his daughters, what ended up happening to his wife, it really wrought, wrought havoc upon his life. Abraham, though, made a decision based upon the promise that God had given him, at least in that circumstance. But he also made bad choices. In Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, we're not going to go there. I mean, we don't need to because we're not, not going to read all that. Abraham was moving towards the plan of God. But along the way, sometimes in our journey, we face situations that we really don't know how to get out of. And so we start thinking in our own mind how we're going to fix it. You know what I'm talking about? We don't even have to make it specific here because every one of us has done it. We try to fix it with our finances. We try to fix the situations with our relationships, with our children. We try to control circumstances and with our job. You get the point. Trying to fix stuff. And our own, listen, God wants us to use wisdom, amen, and he's given us a brain of logic. But at the same time, he wants us to trust him. And in this particular story, Genesis, uh, Abraham moves towards the, the area of Gerar, and there's a, a king there named Abimelech, and he becomes fearful. A spirit of fear jumped on him. You ever had a spirit of fear jump on you? Yes. Even though God had promised Abraham something, and he promised him that he was going to get him through, and that he was going to do these things, the spirit of fear jumped on him. He started to be fearful that Abimelech was going to kill him. And, 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 he, and he connected it to some way with his wife, Sarah, who was very beautiful. And so this clown, Lord, will you help me? Because, I mean, it seems like something I'd probably do. He comes up with this plan that instead of her being his wife, he's going to say she's his sister. Well, that was real smart, Abraham. Because now he wants to marry her. He's like, can I marry your sister? She's beautiful. Well, now you've really messed up. You tried to fix the situation in your own logic, and now you turned it into a circumstance when this king wants to marry your, who you're calling your sister. And it wasn't even a complete lie. We won't get into that. But nevertheless, that was not God's will. God's will was for him to trust the Lord. Thank God God showed up, and he spoke to Abimelech, and he, he showed him that, that it wasn't right for him to touch this woman. And God spared that particular situation. Aren't you glad that God will should still show up in our lives even when we're trying to Big yeah. stuff. Amen. And, and he will still take care of us even yes. in the midst of all of that. But don't, let's not test him. Lord, help yes. us. No, you know what we need? We need help to be able to hear the voice of God and to be, and to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen. Yes. Nevertheless, with all this, Abraham held on to the promise of God regarding God's salvation plan. He staggered not at unbelief in that area. I just want to also point out the fact that even though sometimes we make bad choices in life, While they may very well cause us to veer sometimes out of the way for a period of time, it's important that you understand that. That sometimes we make choices in life that put us on an alternate pathway that cause us to veer outside of the will of God for a period of time, for a season. It doesn't have to remain the path that we take until the end. It doesn't mean that Satan gets the last say-so. Amen? God is our future, and he has the last say so about our life. Let's look at some hope scriptures real quick. You ready? The first concept I want to talk to you about is that we can find hope in prayer. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. This is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. One of the things I, I wanted to share with you was that we have hope in prayer, but I need you to look a little more closely at that second clause in verse 14. He says this, we have confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. See, sometimes we lose confidence that there's hope in prayer because we're not praying according to the will of God. Right, right. Amen? Yes. 
Can I get an amen? amen? I need to let you know that it's possible for a believer to pray outside of the will of God. No matter how spiritual we think we are, no matter how much we love God, how much we love the word, how much we love the presence of God, it is possible for us to pray outside the will of God. You know why? Because man also has his own free will. That's right. And many times man wants what he wants. Can I get an amen? It's not a good thing, but it is a real thing. Look at James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This is one of those scriptures that I always used to not try to read because it always like really brought a lot of correction into my life. Amen. So that's a good reason to make sure we read it. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Now, you got to understand that James is actually talking to believers. He's writing this letter to believers. So he's asking the question for you out there, for me. Where do these wars and fightings come from that we deal with? Whether it be amongst people in the church, whether it be in our own individual homes between husbands and wives, fathers and children, whatever the case. Where do these wars and fightings come from among you? Do they not come or come they not hints even of your lusts? Now, let's just kind of change that word there so that we can get a little bit better understanding. Many times when we hear the word lust, we automatically think of sensual or sexual desire. But the word itself literally means any desire for anything. Amen. And it could be a good desire. And then in that case, that word in the Greek would be used for something good and godly. Or it could be a bad desire. And in that case, the word is used for something that we're not supposed to have want of. And in this particular scripture, it's talking about bad desires. It says that, uh, that, that, that your lust, that war in your members, there's a war going on on the inside of us that's trying to take our free will and push us towards something that's going to derail us and cause us to move outside the will of God. Right. He says you lust and have not. You have a desire, but you still don't have it. You kill. Sometimes the spirit that we operate in was to cause spiritual murder to people. Sometimes the, the envy and the jealousy in our heart can rise up on the inside of us. And we're thinking all kinds of ungodly things. Come on, somebody. I know I'm not the only one that's messed up over here. Thank you, brother. You might be right. <laughs> You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask when you do ask, and you receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. It's because you're not get, God's not going to give you everything that you ask for because sometimes the things that you're asking for will literally destroy you. So it's possible for Christians to pray out of lustful desire and that it isn't even God's will at all, right? You know, the words for war describes dispute, strife, quarrel, fightings, controversy, fighting, striving. Those words, don't those words sound like sometimes on a Sunday morning before you go to church? In the car on the way over here. And that's why I drive by myself to church. I can't fight with nobody, just me and the Lord. <laughs> Because Lord knows I didn't have plenty of fights on a Sunday morning. And that, the enemy just shows up on Sunday morning like no other time trying to cause frustration, trying to cause aggravation, trying to cause strife and controversy. Yeah. He's trying to get us out of the spirit of God. He's trying to get us away from being ready to worship the Lord and to look at him of how beautiful he is, how worthy he is. And we show up half the time, do we not? Frustrated. Lord, help us and set us free. Yes, Amen. Amen. God will set us free from that. Yes, Lord, give us a, a give, speak to our spirits, Lord God, and give us a desire yes. to desire your will. Amen. Yes. This is the second thing you can have hope in. There's hope in the fact that he will take care of our needs. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes it feels like he's not. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you this. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. In other words, he's not going to change his mind. Has he said it and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken and how shall he not make it good? That's the word of the Lord. Yeah. Numbers chapter, that was Numbers, you don't have to turn there, but Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. This is what he said, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Let's turn to that one. 
Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? How many times have we read this scripture in this church? How many times have we preached this particular scripture in this church? But you know what? It never affects our heart. It never affects our mind like it will when we're actually going through it. Right. When we're questioning, Lord, maybe not where the next meal is going to come from. Amen. Because by the grace of God, the church will help you with it if you're really that hungry. Amen. But still the things of life, the needs that we have, we start to wonder, we start to worry. How is God going to take care of it? And how are we going to take care of our situation? What shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. You can, you can place, I know we had a big discussion about that word heathen, I think last week. You can place the word heathen right there. Because that's what the idea is. Gentiles were nations that did not know the God of Israel. So what is it talking about? For you and I today, people that do not know the God that you serve. Those are the things that the world worries about. Oh, how are we going to pay the light bill? How are we going to take care of this? No, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to stress about that. You just need to learn by grace to trust the Lord in the midst of all that. Everything that you face and all that you go through, if he allows you to go through it, is for a greater purpose. For your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Do, do you believe with me that there's the possibility that sometimes God allows these types of things to happen in our life? Because maybe we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? Each and every one of us in this place. We know Jesus now. We're saved. Amen. God now desires to do a kingdom work. Yeah. I preached, I was able to preach at the chapel service on Friday, and that was the message that the Lord gave me. I filled Bezalel with my spirit, the house of God, the work of God. God's creating his house in you so that he can do his work through you. Once you get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now he desires to work through you. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to use you as a vessel and you might not all stand behind the pulpit and some of you will praise God, but nevertheless, God wants to use you in some way or circumstance, whether it be through your finances, whether it be through the giving of your time, whether you being a witness to someone out there that just needs to hear about the love of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's many times a problem, though, that Christians face when we're trying to build our own kingdom with the plans that it will be OK to bring whatever we gathered out there with us when we decide to seek his kingdom. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I mean, I, don't, I can get as specific with this. Well, let me just say I was talking to someone that I love very dearly. We won't really say who it is, but very, very dearly. And I was trying to say, but sometimes but you, sometimes you're doing things the wrong way. You're trying to like say, okay, I'm going to connect myself with this because this is, uh, this, you know, we have a mutual, okay, let's just say we got two single people that, that maybe aren't serving the Lord. I'm just going to go ahead and say they aren't serving the Lord, but they want to serve God. All right? That's good. Okay, so the next thing, but neither one of us are really living for the Lord. I'm just using this as an illustration. All right? Neither one of us are serving the Lord right now, but you want to serve God. I want to serve God. So let's come together. And we're going to come together and now we'll serve God together. Well, hold on a second. You weren't serving the Lord to begin with. You got, I'm not saying it's impossible. God is much bigger than this preacher up here that's trying to tell you about things that he's observed. God can do anything the way that he wants to do it. But typically, you over here wasn't serving the Lord to begin with. You over here weren't necessarily serving the Lord to begin with. So now you think we're going to bring both messages together and all of a sudden we're going to serve the Lord? No. That's not the way it works. You surrender your life to the Lord and you desire to do the will of God instead of building your own kingdom, work upon building his kingdom. Then all of a sudden the Lord will show up and give you the desires of your heart. He will meet your needs. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the word of God. That's how God works. Now, once again, let me be clear on this. It doesn't mean that if we've done that. That he can't still bless us. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I mean, God is bigger than, than Matt's little rules of interpretation. God is much bigger than anything that this preacher will ever say. I will say this, though, and this is really more about a word of encouragement than anything else. So please don't take it the wrong way. I watched a movie a long time ago, probably back in the 80s. Might have been called Flatliners. I'm not real sure. 
I know it wasn't a very godly movie at all. It was a carnal movie. But you know, there was a concept in there. I think it was a bunch of medical students, and they were giving themselves a shot of something that'd kill them, but they were waiting right there because they wanted to see what was in the afterlife. They were waiting right there to, boom, to pop them with the with the, the, the defibrillator to bring them back. But the problem was that they brought some stuff back with them. That's the point that I'm trying to make. God will bless our lives as long as we desire to serve him. But sometimes the decisions that we made before we came in to serve him, we carry some of that stuff over with us. So don't get frustrated when you find yourself in the midst of a circumstance and there's some things that the Lord's having to deal with. Hold on to the Lord. Trust him. Even though he's not moving up and showing up as fast as you want him to, don't let despair grip your heart. Amen. God will show up if you continue to walk with him and trust him along the way. Point number three, there's hope in the cross. Look at Romans chapter five, verses one through five. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope makes not ashamed. It's a message of hope this morning. Hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know, a simplified version of this verse, because usually I break it down so deep we lose our train of thought. The cross makes us right with God, and the result is that we have access to grace. Grace gives us strength, and even when we find ourselves in times of despair, God won't waste it. Amen? Amen. He uses those trials of life and mixes it with the grace we have access to through the cross, and he gets us through the trial, and the result is hope. Why? Because it's proven again in our lives that God is who he says he is and that his word can do what it says it can do. So even though you find yourself in a trial this morning, fret not, child of God. Trust in him. Keep your eyes focused on him and his spirit will show up to give you grace. Amen. To get you through the trial. And if you just hold on and be patient in your walk, you're going to learn some things through it all. You're going to be wiser for the for the result of it all. Amen. That sounds right. And our heart says, I want to see that in my life. Amen? Doesn't doesn't that sound right? That even though I'm going through some things, even though I feel pain, God will be with me and he's going to get me through. Doesn't that bring true to your heart? No matter how heavy you might feel right now. Hopefully you're not feeling heavy right now. But even no matter how heavy you might feel tonight. No matter how heavy you might feel tomorrow. Amen? No matter how heavy, it just ought to sound right. And your heart would say, I want to see that in my life. Well, guess what? That's point number four. There's hope that he will open our spiritual eyes so that we can see his working power. I don't know about you. Look at look at Ephesians 1, 17 through 20. I don't know about you, but I need a revelation from the Holy Spirit to be able to see. I believe all the things that the preacher taught me. I believe it. Well, at least the preachers that I that I believe. (laughs) I believe all the things that they taught me. But I need a revelation from the Holy Spirit to be able to see it, to make it real in my heart. It says right here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Look at this. This is the part I want you to see. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. You know what? The hope of his calling is connecting you to your past. Have you ever stopped and thought about where you used to be and where he's brought you to? So I don't know about you, but man, I'm telling you what, I think about that a lot. And I don't (laughs) want to go back where I was. Thank you, Jesus, for pulling me out of there. The hope of his calling, he wants to give you a revelation of that. Amen. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Not only did he take care of your past, but he's also got a future for you. you. There's an inheritance waiting for you. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Essentially, listen, 
I'm not, I don't want to spend too much time here, but, but that word wrought has always stuck out to me. An English translation of that word, one of the main definitions, means to des it's describing something that is beaten and shaped with a hammer, wrought iron. You have iron ore, but in order for it to turn out to be the thing that it was intended to be, it has to be, first of all, it has to be uh, molded into the right shape. But then even after that, it has to be worked with. It has to be heated and, and hammered and twisted. You ever seen a wrought iron fence, how beautiful it looks? I mean, sometimes that iron's twisted and they make a little pointy thing out of it. And it just looks so nice whenever it's a completed pro project, right? But, but do you realize that there's also, can you imagine the old blacksmith and he's adding some, some heat to it. Then he's banging it with a hammer and he's twisting it and he's molding it. And he's making it to look the way that he desired it to look so that it could be used for its intended purpose. You've been wrought in Christ Jesus. The power of God is rotting. I know that that's not really a word, but I'm going to use it. It's been rotting a work in you. The word in the Greek is energio, where we get our word energy from. It's descriptive of the work and the power of the Holy Spirit producing something in you, forming you, shaping you. The Holy Spirit doing that. But listen, you know what you need? You need to be able to see that. That's right. You need the eyes of your inner man. To be enlightened. Right, right. Lord, help us yes. to be able to see spiritually the work that you're doing in us. Lastly, now if you want to come to the front, place a, place a song on the keyboard. Lastly, there's hope that we will see him. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Yes. You know, the Apostle Paul said one time that we would be most pitiable, is what he said. If the only hope that we have is Christ on this earth today. What he meant by that was this. He said there better be something else in the future. Because even with Jesus. Even with Jesus we still go through trials. Yes, yes. We still face situations and circumstances. But he was trying to make the point that there's more than what you're experiencing here today. And I don't know about you but I need to be reminded that God has a future plan. Yes. Yes. That's why it's so important that we get a revelation of that today. To live for him today. Look at for, uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 through 13. There's a blessed hope on the way. Jesus is coming back for his church one day. That's why in the meantime, we're supposed to live for him. That's why in the meantime, we're supposed to defer ourselves from the lusts of this earth. From the things that this world has to offer. Look at this. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Jesus Christ. If that's not enough to encourage us to want to live for the Lord today, knowing that one day Jesus is coming back for his church, amen? He wants to find us doing well, being good and faithful servants. Do you, do you have the hope of the blessed hope in your heart this morning? Do, do you look forward to the day that Jesus is coming back to get you? I think that sometimes that's what happens to young Christians or even sometimes old Christians, that they lose sight of that. They lose sight of the Lord returning. And they get so caught up in the here and now. 